Well, good evening. Welcome to Freedom in Christ Ministries. Uh, I had told you last week we're going to start a series on anger, and uh, that was my intention, but I've had a change of mind. And uh, so you're watching our live Facebook uh, tonight. I, I may pick it up later on. And I want to talk a little bit about anger and, uh, and, and introduce some ideas to you. Uh, but if you got some questions about that, now's a good time to ask some final questions because I won't be live again, uh, maybe some other time, but not for a while anyhow. And uh, so, but thanks for listening. Anger. Do we have an anger problem in the world, in America? Listen to this. U.S. News Online had this quote. A vast majority of Americans feel their country has reached an ill-mannered watershed. Nine out of ten Americans thinks incivility is a serious problem, and nearly half think it is extremely serious. 78% say the problem has worsened in the last 10 years. Now listen, folks, that poll was taken 20 years ago when the global economy was relatively stable. 9-11 hadn't happened yet. Cell phones were just in their infancy. ISIS was an unknown. And uh, so how are we doing 20 years later? And a, just a kind of a fascinating study, why they did or who knows, uh, came out of China. And uh, they surveyed 70 million uh, hits on the internet, and they discovered, they were looking at it and examined it in terms of uh, what kind of emotion is being <coughs> put over the airways, and uh, what they found out, that the number one emotion expressed on the internet is rage. People are ticked off everywhere. The sobering thing was they found out that it was just uh, communicated to a second and a third generation that would pick that up as well. Esquire magazine about uh, three years ago, this is kind of important, wrote this. We the people are ticked off. The body politic is burning up. And the anger that comes, that courses through our headlines and news feeds about injustice, inequality, marginalization, disenfranchisement, about what they're doing to us shows no sign of abating. Half of Americans are angrier today than they were a year ago. That was published a year before the last election, presidential election. How ticked off do you think they were the next year? This is a, you know, obviously a global problem. And, uh, and we're just seeing people everywhere. There's just, there, there's just a, a subtle sense of anger that just kind of pervades the societies. And then something comes along and people go postal and you get all these shootings and everybody runs to somehow or another change the, the politics. And I said, <laughs> It's not what's outside of the heart that defiles us. It's what's inside. It's what's going on within us. Rage is, is, is there, and anger has been there ever since the fall. I mean, you know, the fact that it destroyed families and ministries around the world it has been going, an ongoing phenomena ever since the fall. What is so different right now is that the media-driven escalation of businesses is making it available to everybody, even a kid, could pick up a cell phone and hear about another mass shooting or something. Uh, we got this note in our office that while you're at it, you might want to think about writing a book for angry teenagers. My 16-year-old daughter's anger has over the years slowly turned her mind away from Christ and toward the pop culture. Her situation is an ironic one that exists, I believe, in many homes with Christian schools, church, family values have been prominent. For her, the situation posed a dilemma. If she chose Christ, she would never fit in. That's kind of familiar to even us adults today. Uh, it's amazing how the political tide has turned against Bible-believing Christians. They were always seen to be good people, but suddenly we're the problem. She said, if she chose pop culture, she jeopardized her relationship at home and with this, quote, distant God who doesn't care anywhere, uh, because he doesn't give me what I want. You have teenagers? <laughs> so she got stuck in an angry defiance. At home, she acts out her anger. At school, she decided to get rougher and tougher so that she won't be hurt. Looking back, I see that I was clueless about the roots of anger and the consequences of wrong thinking. On the outside, it seemed like we were on top of the situation yet there were critical stages of anger that we didn't have the tools to see or confront. Now we are doing more parental intervention in our life. Hopefully it isn't too late. 
I guess I can't encourage you enough. I said, what kind of made up my mind is I was rereading my book on managing your anger that I did with Rich Miller. I just didn't feel live I could do the book justice. This is a kind of a book you need to get in a small group or family and digest it and ask questions and just really uh, make it a part of your life uh, just to, to, to integrate. I mean, uh, all of the world that is going around us and how do we as spirit-filled Christians live in a culture today that is just basically falling apart as it seems and walking away as fast as they seemingly can from the God who created them. I mean, we're living in perilous times, but I said anger is not the response that we need to have out of our Christian churches. It would only escalate the problem. And so somehow this has to be a manageable thing in our own life. And uh, the outline, if you're looking for one for the book, and the outline for understanding anger, let me just read it. It's Ephesians chapter 4. Laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiven others, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, when you look at anger, you need to see it in three dimensions. First of all, is the things that tick you off today. I mean, daily events. And anger is so much about control. I mean, you're sitting in your house, you, you, it's relatively calm, and you're pretty much in control of the situation around you, and suddenly you get out in traffic. Now listen to the self-talk as you drive your car. Somebody starts a little late. Hurry up, stupid. Get off the cell phone. For crying out loud, the light changed 10 minutes ago. I mean, this is going on in everybody's mind. And the whole reason is you can't control it. You can't control politics either. And, uh, and so what do you do? I mean, how do you control this thing that's going on in your mind? And so road rage has become a major phenomena in our time that people have all of this pent-up energy and don't know how to express it. There was a study done in terms of how people respond to anger in their own cars, and I was was kind of blown by it. Some yell outside, some pound the dash. uh, uh, About 3% actually will occasionally go up and bump the car ahead of them. I said, not a good thing to do. And then occasionally you hear somebody, like just happened in Texas, you know, get fired and go out and just start shooting people you know, as he drives down the freeway. I mean, how tragic is that? It's, uh, so you have the, the present day thing, which is really a matter of your mind. You know, when I drove three times a day to take care of my wife for the last three years and skilled nursing, I had a lot of chance to drive in traffic and I was writing this book. And it was just amazing, uh, uh, kind of learning it myself. I, I mean, you know, I, it's one of those kind of things, well, I know that. Well, then just listen to yourself talk, Anderson. And, and, uh, and gosh, it was helpful. I've got to just be honest with you. I mean, it brought such a greater sense of peace to me in driving my car. I say, I'm going to get there no matter what. Don't worry about it. And, uh, and, but it's so instantaneous. It's so fast. When somebody doesn't take off just when you want to, immediately there's this kind of a jump within you. And, and you can just sense the anger swell up. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, well, that's one dimension. I mean, just learning to control that in terms of our own thought life. This is, you know, if we're really filled with the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Patience is an interesting word. It's actually two words. It really, it was translated one time, long-suffering. It, it's a long time before you become angry. Thumas is actually in the word itself. And uh, so the point of it is, is that those who have learned patience uh, can endure a lot more in this sense before they go postal. <laughs> And uh, the other issue is that uh, what he describes later, later on when he says, put away all anger and wrath and clamor, uh, he's really talking more now about flesh patterns. There's a learned aspect. We have a whole chapter in here just kind of identifying certain flesh patterns that you may say, oh, that's kind of me. 
And uh, we want to help you with that. It doesn't identify who you are. You're a child of God. But if you understand your own flesh patterns, uh, for instance, it, it, mom and dad found out they could control their kids in their presence by being angry. And so the kids would respond. It worked. I controlled my kids. So what are you going to continue to do? Stay angry with your <laughs> kids. Not a good way to raise your family, folks. I mean, you know, an outburst of anger is the deed of the flesh. It's something you should apologize for, not smile that I just got control of the kids. And um, I mean, so if, if that's a pattern, then you got kids growing up with angry parents. And how does that make them feel towards you, for that matter? You say, well, God gets angry. You know, righteous indignation is a legitimate thing. We have a whole chapter on that. and uh, But it's kind of overplayed you know, by too many people too often. I said, but God never gets angry. He has no block goals. Uh, the wrath of God is, is a common theme in Scripture, but it's against unrighteousness. You want to be angry, not sin. Be angry at sin is the idea. He didn't turn over the money changers. He turned over the money changers' table. And when he saw the, you know, the heart, he was angry at the Pharisees at the time, but at the hardness of their heart. And, um, and he was never lost control. I mean, God doesn't lose control and has no black goals. Uh, so that's one dimension of it. The other dimension, it's one thing to be angry or to have angry, angry as kind of a flesh pattern that you just kind of, you know, I get my way this way. I control people around me by being angry. And so people kind of get out of my way and, and uh, use fear, I suppose, as a way of uh, manipulating other folks. But uh, it's one thing to get angry. It's another thing to be angry. Angry people are wounded people. Uh, I, I discovered that years ago uh, when I just first started taking people through the steps of freedom. And, uh, and, and these people would come in, they've been hurt. I mean, they're angry. The injustice of it is overwhelming to them. They just want to just go out and tear somebody apart, but they, they feel powerless to do it. And, and uh, <clears throat> I have another, I think, very important chapter in the book about anger and how, what it does to you personally. It can kill you. You can literally fall over and die of a coronary uh, with a you know, persistent rage in your life. And, uh, and, and so there's physiological things that take place in your body when you exhibit that kind of anger, especially if it's a prolonged kind of an anger. And so it's a health issue for you as well. And it's a health issue for those that are around you <laughs> as well. But so the answer to that is, is on forgiveness. I have seen people melt in the presence of God when they work through the most difficult abuses in their life and finally find that freedom and realize that person has no control over them anymore, they don't think about them anymore, and they're free from their past, no longer an angry person. Uh, I can't overemphasize how important that is. We cover all three of those very thoroughly, I think, in the book, and um, <clears throat> my my excuse me, my, my hope is is that enough people listening will, will get a book like this and get a few people together and actually work through this. We have an answer for this, people. It's not like, like this is something without the boundary of our ability to control. Self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. It, it's, uh, it's something that God wants us to have. On the other hand, there's a time out there, righteous indignation, Anger is what we should feel, and that should help us to pursue righteousness around us and right the wrongs that are out there. There's a legitimate place for that, and we try to explain, you know, kind of the boundaries of that as well. Uh, I want to just kind of share something with you, because I want to share a testimony. It's a very unusual testimony. It, it has so many elements to it. Uh, I just got it online. I don't know these people. Uh, and that's kind of explained in, in the testimony. But it shows you the scope of what can happen if our churches are equipped around the world to truly help people resolve their personal and spiritual conflicts. I mean, people who have just wanton uh, sex and whatever else, there is an answer. As, you, as I share this story, I want you to think about something. If these people went in to see a counselor, it probably would have been for anger. Rage, they'll talk about it. And they would not have been able to help them. 
If they had gone into an anger management class, there's absolutely no way they could have helped this couple. Listen to their story. I am sure you get many letters from people, but I felt I needed to share our story with you. I also know that you have heard many sordid things in your years in ministry, so I'll not hold back. Forgive me if I get too personal, but I think you need to know, know it all to understand the magnitude of what has taken place. My boyfriend and I met a little over a year ago. We were both in relationships and found each other online in the looking for an affair section. Honestly, folks, I didn't know such a section exists, but there's something for everybody. We started having an affair, and as we got to know each other better, we discovered that we had a lot in common. This was not a good thing. You see, both of us came from dysfunctional families with unhealthy religious backgrounds. He was raised in a Jehovah Witness church in which he was molested by several men and women of the congregation, including his mother and sister, beginning at age six. Deviant sex was love to him, so he lived his life in search of it. He's a sex addict. I grew up in a dysfunctional home and attended a very legalistic church. As a result of the neglect and abuse I suffered as a child, I learned that sex in men would give me what I was lacking. I too am a sex addict. There are many stories and dark experiences we both have had as a result of this. There have even been same-sex encounters, multiple partners and affairs, and involvement in sexually deviant behaviors too numerous to list. I cringe now when I think of what we both have seen and done as individuals and as a couple. Now I have the rage disorder we both struggle with, the substance abuse issues, illegal activities, of pretty much every bo other bondage you can think of. We were a couple of train wrecks. Since we got along so well, we decided to leave our marriages for each other, destroying families in the process. So here we are, living our lives, doing anything and everything our flesh desired. Then one day we had a conversation about church. We both had come from religious backgrounds after all. It started out with a random thought, but then something changed. We both had a desire to go back to church. We found one we both liked, but the guilt and the shame we felt from our lives made it difficult. I wanted to run every time the worship started. I got very uneasy and antsy. I heard voices saying that I didn't belong. I wasn't like these other people. I was filth. My being there would only make them dirty instead of making me clean. I would have negative and evil thoughts towards other people there. It was so unlike me. It went this way for a while. I would go, but I was shut down mentally as we entered the church, so I got nothing out of it. Then one day I remembered the steps to freedom in Christ. I had taken the classes years prior in a church, but never actually did the steps. I figured attending the class was close enough. Anyway, I ordered victory over the darkness and the bondage breaker, but the bondage breaker came first, so we started that. We were both having a hard time at first, but it was a, it was a little harder for me. The day I knew Satan had hold of me was when my husband was trying to love me through one of the steps, and a voice, not my own, told me to hurt him. I could feel my jaw clench and my eyes narrow as the hate rose up in me. I had a literal burning desire to harm him. The awareness in that moment that it was no longer me, but Satan controlling me was indescribable, and it scared me straight. Since that day, we both have surrendered to God. We completed the steps to freedom. All of them, she said. We are attending church every week, have daily devotions, both together and privately. We pray, read the word. We have stopped all the sinful behaviors we were involved in before. Our anger has subsided. People have actually commented on the changes. We have inner peace, and the noise in my head is finally gone. We have become involved in ministry and are working diligently every day to serve our Lord in obedience. We have a real passion for people like us now and want to help others find the freedom we have found. The changes that have happened in our lives are nothing short of an act of God. Where we came from and where we are now makes me want to weep with gratitude, and I often do. The Lord is good and faithful, and he never leaves us nor forsakes us, even people like us. He was waiting with open arms for you too. It's hard to believe 
how far down society has gone that could destroy marriages, destroy families like that, uh, you know, dysfunctional churches that we come out of. I said, folks, there is a God who loves us in the midst of all of the chaos that exists out there. Rage would have been the problem that everybody saw in them, but what's going on inside? That's why in the book we included the steps to freedom. We're not just trying to give information. We want transformation. We want people to experience that kind of freedom. You think you've had a bad life? Can't be much worse than that, folks. It really can't be. And if God can intervene in that life, and you know what's so, what I love about God, to be honest with you, is it wasn't actually anybody that, that prompted them to go back to church. It was God. But somewhere in the past, she had that little experience at a church that reminded me Maybe there is a way that we can actually get rid of this junk in our life and find our freedom in life. They did it on their own. That's possible for anybody listening. Even, even when your life is screwed up that bad. They said, uh, I emailed them back. I said, do, you have, do I have your permission to use this to share? She said, please do. Share with as many as you want to. There is an answer. We can be free in Christ, and God wants us free. Um, Folks, I've got a lot of stuff coming up ahead of me. I'm very excited about it. I'm going to go back to Biola University, Talbot School of Theology Chapel in October. I haven't been back in years, and I'm going to share my life story with them. Uh, some of the hard lessons in life that I've gone through, most of them were worked out while I was at that school. I'm going to present in about three weeks American Association of Christian Counseling on fear. The workshop has been filled up for some time. Uh, I'm going to speak at discipleshipcounseling.org when it meets at Brentwood Baptist in November. Uh, ACC has asked me to do uh, an hour video series for training churches on bondage, breaking bondages in people's lives. And so God has just given me a, you know, a great opportunity, and I thank him for it. And, and, but I want to finish well. And, and the last thing I want to have happen is, God, there's an old man, he's 77 years old, and he's still, I don't want to do that. I, I watched these quarterbacks play one seat year too long, and I want to finish well. So uh, I'm a little more adapted on doing the other, but thank you for listening all these years. I do want to mention one other resource, because it just came out. It's called the Bondage Breaker Devotional. When Harvest House first asked me to do that, I said, the Bondage Breaker Devotional? Uh, you know, they're a great company, folks, but they're checking off of a successful book. And, uh, and I understand that. I said, but I can't just do it on the bondage breaker. And so I said no at first. Then I come back, I said, well, this may give me an opportunity to take key things out of 70 books and, you know, 50 years of ministry and say, what are kind of the essential things we really need to know? You know, truth will set us free. And so... 200 pages with critical points. It's kind of like some famous musician who put out 64 albums, and then at the end of his career, he said, here's my best. And, uh, and things. they're short little sayings. We're used to sound bites today, and it's very difficult to write a lot in 250 words, which they limited me to. Uh, but I, I hope you will find it helpful for you, and uh, maybe share it with somebody else. We have a question. Somebody <clears throat> new to your ministry said, how could I offer this at my church? Christ. Well, it's being offered in churches all over the world. There's something like five or 6,000 churches in England that is doing our discipleship course. And, uh, and it's available online. Just go to freedominchristministries.org and uh, you can see our basic course. That started out as a conference that I did many, many years ago, which I've shared all around the world. Then we packaged it into a video series. I did the first one. The one that's out right now has three presenters. Daryl Fitzgerald is an African-American pastor, dear friend of mine. Uh, he's one of the presenters. Nancy is a Hispanic background. She lives in Spain right now. And then Steve Goss, our international director, are the presenters. But it's the same truth, same material. And uh, you can buy a whole kit for your church, use it as a small group or a Sunday school class. Uh, we also have online training. Uh, go to our, our website. The people all around the world are taking that. And, um, uh, you know, if they want to become an associate with us, uh, they have to go to a four-day uh, practicum. 
where they're led through the steps, they lead somebody through the steps while, and they're being observed while they're doing it. So all the training is there. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we want people to get through that first experience, discovering who they are in Christ, and go through a genuine repentance process and find the freedom that Christ purchased for them. Now you still got flesh patterns. That's, a, that's a, be, a beginning, not an end. But until you're really free, the whole process of learning is just thwarted. I said, but once you're free in Christ, once you know who you are in Christ, then the Spirit of God just kind of works through you. And so we deal with flesh patterns. We have one on anxiety disorders. We have one on this book on anger right in here. We have one on, on marriage. We have one on sexual addiction. And you can just follow that up and help people overcome these problems. I said, free people not only make good disciples, but they're an incredible witness in their community. It's like the couple of, they sent me the testimony. People could see the change in their life. What was it? Well, it wasn't Neil Anderson, it was Christ. The only one who can set you free is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you know, thank you for listening all this time. I, I've tried to share on these series that are going to go to YouTube and be up there for a while. You know, what discipleship counseling is, our, our basic core message. Then we went through uh, depression, then we went through anxiety and fear. And I said, those are the number one, number two mental health problems of the world. Uh, and God has an answer for us. And I pray that you take advantage of it and find your freedom in Christ. Folks, the world needs you. The world needs liberated children of God to spend the message around that God loves us and died for our sins, was resurrected, that we'd have life, and he came to undo the works of Satan. That's the gospel. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your prayerful support of Freedom in Christ Ministries. All of our content is made possible by you. Your generous support and financial gifts make these videos and our ministry possible. For more information on how to support our ministry, please visit www.freedominchrist.org and click Get Involved.